All right. It's about time I talk about idea groups. So actually, I won't really talk about idea groups, but rather I'll more talk about or I'll more talk about modifiers. Okay, and then I'll sort of instantiate some of the things I talk about to certain idea groups, a case study, if you will call it like that, and talk about certain idea groups. Okay, um, and for the, for the people who have more useful things to do with their time, I will give a TLDW. Okay, here are the things I'll say. I'll say, I know bad, and you're bad. I'll also say espionage is still mediocre. I'll say horde gov idea is bad. Okay, and you're bad. And by the way, in, in, in case you don't know me, I'm sarcastic here. You know, I'll hate for someone new to suddenly watch this. This probably isn't a good representation of things I like to post on YouTube. But, you know, if you're new here and you don't know me, uh, be note that, do, do, be aware that I'm being sarcastic here. Well, not really, but I am certainly being ironic here. And uh, what else should I talk about? Mm. I'll also talk about the role between humanist and religious. So I guess these would be my main contents, but uh, this is my video, so I get to talk about pedantic theory first, um, which may or may not be useful until you sort of internalize it. And even if you, after you internalize, it's not even clear how useful this is. But so first I wanna talk about, excuse me, first I wanna talk about modifiers in U4. Okay, so when I say modifiers, I just mean things that buff your country. I think that's a sensible way to define it. So let me give you an example, 10% tax, that's a buff. Uh, you know, 30% manpower, plus one missionary. So I'm referring to all these things that uh, I believe the game calls modifiers. And yeah, intuitively they're modifiers. Makes sense, right? And there are many ways one can partition or classify a group of things, in, in this case, modifiers. One way one might try to classify it is to take the approach that EU4 does, which I think is somewhat misleading in the edge cases, where they say certain things are admin modifiers, certain things are dip modifiers, certain things are mill modifiers. Okay, um, EU4 really likes to sort of try, try to split everything in these three categories. So for example, things that are related to Navy, things that are related to trade, uh, culture, diplomacy, these all fall, fall under dip modifiers. And this, and I say that EU4 approved because if you try to build a custom nation, uh, they will sort of force you to categorize, or they'll, they'll sort of give you a category um, that's precisely admin dip and mill. Admin, on the other hand, includes stuff like uh, tax, uh, core creation, mm, inflation, dev cost, and so on. Mill, actually mill is I think fairly decent. Mill is just like all things related to military, manpower, you know, unit buffs like discipline, morale, general related buffs, and, and so on. Um, and that's certainly one sensible way to classify uh, modifiers. And sometimes it's useful to think about modifiers in this sort of partitioning scheme. 
Uh, here's another way to classify modifiers that, again, falls under the same problem of if you look at the edge cases, it's a bit unclear or it might be a bit weird. And this classification does not even attempt to hide or avoid from that fact. Um, <coughs> so active versus passive. That's the dichotomy that I want to propose regarding modifiers. And again, uh, this is not a good attempt at coming up with like some objective partitioning. It's just a way to think about certain modifiers. So the idea is that certain, certain modifiers are more active uh, than others. Okay. So I would like to pretend like they're on two sides of the same dimension. The reality is like they're 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 that you know uh, you can have modifiers that are active and passive, but <coughs> for the sake of I guess my my argument and for simplification, I will sort of pursue this um, approach. Okay, so intuitively active modifiers are useless unless you do things with them. Here's an example of something that is purely active. So there's a modifier that gives you a diplomat. That is absolutely useless if you don't use the diplomat, right? It requires action on the player to do something with that diplomat. <coughs> now, I must admit that diplomats are fairly uh, well ingrained into the game, so it's kind of hard to avoid not using it. But here's another one which may or may not um, fall, in the, fall in a similar category. Um, in fact, it might be a bit stronger than the diplomat case, which is a missionary. Missionaries are useless if you don't have anything to convert, right? And there are certainly valid playstyles where people don't have things to convert. Maybe they just don't conquer too much, right? Or maybe part of their role playing requires them to not convert anything. Maybe they want to role play as someone who is religiously tolerant, right? So these are some of the active modifiers, and these are like clearly active, right? And on the other hand, there are passive modifiers. These are things that give the, give the player certain benefits. And moreover, it gives, it gives the players, at, at its peak, gives any player the same amount of benefit, no matter what they try to do with it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that certain players or play styles will favor some of the benefits more, but uh, it just means that it provides the same amount of benefit. So here is uh, maybe the primary example of a passive modifier. Well, hmm. I had one in mind, and I realized that it's not that good. So I'm thinking of something better, but I can't think of one immediately off the top of my head. So I will actually stick with tech cost. Okay. Why is tech cost passive? Well, 10% tech cost means that whatever you know uh, tech you're getting, each tech will cost 60 monarch points cheaper. Okay, and there are only a certain number of techs in the game. So it really is just you take this and you get a certain number of monarch points as you sort of increase your tech. And there's nothing active about tech cost in, in the sense that you don't really use tech cost uh, in the same way you use a missionary diplomat. Now you could argue uh, the player has to actively click the tech up button and that's certainly valid, and that's why I realized that's not a uh, it's it's not an example of something that's purely passive. But um, I think it sort of rings the idea that ten percent tech cost is equally useful 
on every play style, assuming, assuming, well, I ignoring the fact that certain play styles might try to end the game before they tech up too much. Okay. Um, and I, I tried to come up with some examples that are like clearly in one category. So if we go back to the more like honest chart, uh, I sort of came up with these. Um, but the reality is certain things or most things fall somewhere in between here. Let me give you an example of something that is like pretty darn active. CCR. Actually, CCR is actually a really good example of something that's purely active as well. You have to conquer things to core, right? I guess arguably you can unstate your provinces and then state it and then record it for no reason. Well, there might be reasons like you might want to culture flip, but so so there are things like CCR, um, war score cost reduction. You need to win wars. You need to declare a bunch of wars and make use of the fact that you have extra war score, whether it be by taking more provinces, taking more money, um, and so on, right? Uh, dip annex, that's another one that's quite active. You need to integrate a vassal to even use it. Uh, in fact, there are some like indirect dependencies that one can draw from this, like to integrate a vassal, aside from some of the starting ones on 1444, well, you need to get those vassals, which require certain things, blah, blah, blah. Right? Um, and so generally, here is the theme that I've noticed. Now, you might want to refer to a previous video I made where I tried to convince you that uh, there is no one objective way to play the game. So, um, th which is honestly like quite evident, but it's very easy for us to sort of forget about it and think that the only valid play style is ours, the ones we do, which is totally wrong. Um, but in either case, um, the general pattern that I've noticed is that the worse you are at the game or the less involved you are in the game, if you will, for people who are good but speed fiving and not engaging with the game that much, well, they favor passive modifiers. And that intuitively makes sense because uh, you can't really take advantage of the active modifiers if you don't do things. And players who are unskilled or players who don't spend too much time playing the game, well, um, they are gonna more benefit from some of these modifiers over here compared to these modifiers, okay? So I think this is certainly one interesting way to think about modifiers and try to explain, and this also sort of somewhat explains um, why certain people seem to favor certain modifiers or certain idea groups more, okay? Um, and the next thing I want to talk about regarding modifiers is the notion of, uh, let's say, substitutability. Maybe that's a good uh, good uh, jargon to use. Did I spell that right? Substitutability. I think I did. So that's the idea that certain modifiers don't. Certain modifiers give you things that you can't get through other means or that are very difficult to get through other means. Okay. Uh, let me give you an example of something that is somewhat substitutable. Diplomat. How do you substitute diplomats? Well, you micromanage your diplomats better, right? There are many situations, even in my runs, by the way, but there are many situations where people are being very suboptimal with how they allocate their diplomats. Um, maybe they're improving on someone who doesn't need improving. Maybe they're um, just keeping them free, thinking they're going to need it. But with maybe further analysis, they can actually infer that they don't need it for like two months. So they could actually use it for two months, right? So you can sort of substitute um, not having that one diplomat with extra diplomat micro. Okay. And what's interesting is that um, this notion of diplomat micro is external to the game. It affects you as the player, how much time you think 
uh, about uh, allocating diplomats, how much um, time you spend thinking about how to allocate your diplomats in an efficient manner and how good you are at sort of predicting how the game pans out in the next few months, let's say. Um, anything that gives like money related bonuses. So for example, like tax, trade, you know, um, even things that reduce cost, right? Uh, things like minus advisor cost or minus uh, infantry cost. Okay, these can all be substituted by, well, having more money, right? You don't need 10% uh, trade income if you have enough money for whatever you wanna do. You don't need the advisor cost if you have enough money to afford it and not care about whatever cost it has. Uh, same with regiment costs or whatever. And how does one get more money? Well, okay, so there's some like loop going on, right? Yeah, if you have these modifiers, it can help you get more money. But overall, sort of being good at the game, right? Conquering a bunch of stuff. In a sane manner. I'll, I'll add sane manner uh, just to avoid the pitfall where people might cite uh, those like crazy 1000 over extension speedruns. Uh, where they are certainly not trying to conquer for the sake of building up a strong country, but they're conquering for the sake of clicking a decision or getting an achievement, right? Um, so yeah, that and and this sort of is another way to sort of explain why certain people might prefer some of these modifiers more. Um, I don't care about any of these modifiers. I mean, I care, but not to the weight that some people put it. Why? Because money rarely becomes a problem for me with my playstyle. okay? And I emphasize my playstyle because not all people have the same playstyle as I do. Uh, in fact, uh, I feel like I'm the only one with my own playstyle nowadays. Actually, there's one, There, actually, sorry, there are a few people like Dumb Idiot, um, Pagoose, uh, Chocolate, and there are some in like the Chinese community, like Terry and, uh, oh shoot, Trist, Trist, Tristalarian, I think that's, that's his name. So yeah. Um, and, uh, what else? Military stuff, right? Military. Uh, I'll exclude siege ability for now. So I will ex exclude siege ability. Okay, again, those are those can be sort of substituted with good army micro in wars, like how you play out the wars. Um, and sort of having more troops. How do you have more troops? Eh. Well, there's also this loop, right? Like you can consider like a force limit or manpower modifier, a military modifier. It certainly is. And that certainly helps you have more troops, but you can have more troops through just sheer economy as well. Okay. So this, so what you sort of notice is that modifiers can be substituted or things you use the modifiers for can be substituted by other things. And I listed how one might try to substitute them. Um, but what you really should be aware is not that you can substitute them, but rather to what extent you can substitute them. For example, I mentioned that you can substitute uh, lacking one diplomat. You can compensate for lacking a diplomat by sort of being better at using your diplomats. And that is, that is true. I, I said something that's factual. Yet, you might notice that in my runs, I have like seven diplomats. Why is that? Part of it is definitely laziness, it's quality of life. It's very nice to have a lot of diplomats uh, handy so you can send peace deals uh, when you need to because you didn't plan for it or something like that. Uh, so that's certainly a reason. But uh, what's the other reason? Well, it turns out that like, if you're like really trying to conquer quickly, then you actually do need a lot of diplomats um, or envoy travel time. 
Otherwise, you will be bottlenecked by just declaring a war, sending peace deals, declaring a war, sending peace deals. That, that actually happens at very optimized gameplay, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about. But um, so that's a case where this notion of substitution doesn't uh, work in certain contexts. Okay, um, so I guess uh, I think that's enough background. I've rambled for what? Wow, 20 minutes already. If you're still here, then good night. Hopefully you're using me as some nice uh, podcast substitute. Oh yeah, here, here's another substitute podcast to my video. Oh, to, to my, um, my Blackboard videos where I just ramble about things. Okay, so hopefully you're using this substitution very well. So let's actually now talk to the meat of the story now that I've sort of put us on the same ground or similar ground or similar footing. Uh, let me talk about certain idea groups. You know, so innovative has been this very uh, perhaps interesting idea group where there are f very fervor, uh, fervent, uh, very passionate supporters of Inno. Um, I would say perhaps the most well-known supporter of Inno is uh, you know a certain robotic vacuum cleaner um, whose company will be acquired by Amazon, I think, soon. Uh, did I draw it well? I think I kind of drew like a Pokeball. I, I meant to draw, you know, those circular vacuum cleaner robots. You probably know what I'm talking about. I, I think. So, um, first, I want to sort of mm, counter some points that some people, not all people, but some people make about why they think Inno is good. Okay. So let me first start with that. That's in no way an argument for why Inno is bad. I'm just countering uh, certain bad arguments about why Inno is good. So there's this idea that taking Inno idea group gives you 10% all power cost. Here, the implication is that the moment you take Inno, you're going to have 100 innovativeness, which is certainly not true. Um, okay, so let's relax that. They say, well, no, no, no. Obviously, you don't instantly get it, but you get it pretty quickly with Inno. So you might as well just say you have it. Um, okay, so that's not true either, but let's suppose that's true. Uh, so if you look at the modifiers, you see this, of Inno. This is the one they're referencing, 50% innovativeness gain. Let's assume that you have 0% innovativeness gain. Um, then by the time you have 66%, 6.6% all power cost. So that's 66 NO. Well, 66.6 NO, 66666. Uh, you'll have roughly 100 innovativeness, right? So really, even in the hypothetical best case, you're getting 3.3% up to all power cost for however long it takes to close this gap. Okay, and uh, let's let's also don't forget the fact that in typical games, okay, at least from my experience, you get innovativeness early because AIs don't tech up super early. Uh, so generally, from my experience, by the time you have the second. Uh, innovative idea, which is the 50% inno gain, you actually already have like 30 innovativeness. Okay, so you're getting that 50% all power costs uh, for the duration of 30 to 100, uh, aka for 70%, right? Um, so uh, how, how much, uh, what's the actual difference in this context? Well, you take this and what, multiply it by two thirds? which is, oh shoot, I should have done the math beforehand. Also, it should have been one thirds. 
okay that 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 seems more yeah that seems more right to me uh so it's just what 20 3 did I do that right? I'm not very good at mental math, in case you, you don't know. Actually, some people think that um, I'm like good at math. I, I don't think that's the case. I, I like math, but there's a reason why I do computer science and not math, even though what I do is very related to math. Um, OK, so that's like one argument thrown out the window. It's like a really shitty argument. And people who sort of genuinely pose that argument should uh, watch whatever that segment I just did. You should just link them that segment. Also, tell them to um, like and subscribe, right? That's what they all do nowadays. Uh, OK, so what are their common arguments are there for Inno? They, oh yeah, here's a fairly fresh one. The plus one free policies. Okay, so I haven't really talked about policies, but uh, it is wrong to think that policies are always worth it. That is wrong, okay? That is a wrong thing to think. So let me just give a background on policies. So in E4, you have these policies. By default, you have three policy slots for each category. And by getting two idea groups filled out, you unlock one in uh, one of these categories. The first one's free. So you can just like fill out whatever here. The next one costs one admin per month, one dip per month, one mil per month, respectively. And plus one free policy says uh, this category is also free, right? It says that this is free. It is wrong to think that plus one free policies means plus one admin dip and mill per month. First of all, it takes quite a bit of time for you to even get to the stage where you're, uh, you're, you're, you're past the first uh, free policies that you are given. Okay, so no, it's not like you suddenly get plus one monarch points each the moment you take the idea. It, it depends on what time you are, right? Um, second of all, it's wrong to assume that people will always take this. I don't always take policies when it's available for me. Why? Because policies, most policies are not worth expending one monitor point uh, per month, at least all the time, right? There are certain policies where I just want to enact and then just keep it for 10 years and then just uh, ditch it. And in certain runs, uh, there might be cases where I don't care about certain monitor points and then I just go for it. For example, in like a one faith, um, after I pretty much conquer the world, I don't really need admin anymore. So I'm happy expending plus one, uh, one admin per month for 1% missionary strength policies. I, I'm okay with that trade. So it, it is wrong to say that um, this gives three monarch points because that assumes that in every single situation, people will always want to uh, enact these policies at the cost of one monarch points, and that's just sadly not the case. Okay, so that's another bad argument down the window. And uh, then I'll I'll I won't give the precise argument, but uh, the whole like I did the math type of arguments. Now I like math, but just because you do math doesn't mean you can conclude whatever the fuck you want. So for example, this is a very dumbed down version of what they say, but they might as well just say this, ready? One plus one equals two, therefore, uh, inno is better than admin or insert any idea group here. That is their argument once you sort of look down into it. They do some meaningless math under very precise assumptions that don't really apply to typical gameplay. Um, assume certain conversion factors of uh, certain things, like uh, the like the one I just mentioned. They just assume that one free policy is one monarch point, and then uh, overlook certain very important things for like other ideas, and then conclude that 
uh, it knows better. No, all they've done is under a very specific set of assumptions that don't at all apply to EU4, they showed that the modifiers in Inno interpreted in a certain manner is is better than some idea other idea group. Uh, for some reason, the Inno crowd seems to really like trying to do the math because, well, I say for some reason. The reason probably is because innovative ideas uh, do things that seemingly give you minor points, right? The free policies, um, the advisor costs, um, tech cost, innovativeness gain. These things somehow like make people think that the role of Inno is to gain minor points. And maybe it is actually, I don't know. Uh, but it, it, it is certainly wrong. It, it is certainly, uh, how should I say it? Very difficult to sort of do a simple idea group to monarch points saved over campaign type of comparison without losing important details. Okay, so sadly, I would say that if you hear anyone say I did the math or insert this authority did the math, well, they're probably, I wouldn't say wrong, but they're essentially saying this, okay? <laughs> actually, uh, sometimes I've seen this, like they're actually doing wrong math <laughs> and they've, they've convinced themselves that this math is right and then, you know, made some weird conclusion. But anyway, so these are me uh, arguing against some common bad arguments for Inno. And that certainly doesn't explain why I don't like Inno or why good players don't like Inno or why good players don't find Inno useful. Um, and it's really the idea of opportunity cost and substitutability. Okay, I really think those two are like the really important ones to think about. So here's Here's a uh, everyone's favorite idea group in full screen. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about prestige decay. Prestige is very useful to have, but ah, substitutability. I can gain a hundred prestige by just declaring more wars and doing certain things with my peace deals. In particular, say I'm in Europe. One thing I really do is I force uh, I force nations to annul their rivalries. That's 30 war score for five prestige. So if you're in like some war and you you have to deal with like five uh, like OPMs and HRE or something, well, you should just separate piece them out and just demand three rivalry cancels, that's 15 prestige total, right? You can also demand war reps if they'll accept 100, uh, which will make it uh, 17 prestige. So you can very quickly get to that 100 prestige point by just playing the game. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone has to play the game like that. If for some reason, maybe like a self-imposed rule set, or because you're bad at the game, um, or you know you don't want to spend that much time playing a game, then this decision making changes because hey maybe if you're not declaring a bunch of wars, uh, maintaining 100 prestige is slightly harder than um, you know uh, maintaining 100 prestige for someone like me. Okay, uh, so 50% in no gain. I think we already talked about that. It really isn't that much, you know. I feel like people see 50%. And they sort of go like, whoa, that's like 1.5x. And you know what? They're right. It is 1.5x. Well, assuming there are no other innovativeness gain modifiers. Um, but uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that doesn't really mean that's good. Uh, OK. So and then tech cost. People, I think, overrate tech cost. Tech cost is very nice to have. But, uh, how should I say it? Aside from the early game, I don't really think you should really struggle on tech. And part of the reason is that you're quite flexible with how you use, how you tech up on tech, how you acquire new tech. You can always wait for neighboring bonuses. 
Um, and in fact, like filling out idea groups, for example, will give you a uh, tech cost reduction. So I, I just think that this is for some reason, extremely overrated. Like it's a good modifier, but nothing to sort of, uh, not, nothing that really carries an idea group. And you know, this is substitutability, right? Money. Um, I'd say this is also just quality of life. It's nice to have an extra advisor pool, but advisor in your pool, but you can always just like fire advisors and get whatever one you want. Okay. This one. So this is a weird one. Like this is basically useless. Like I, I swear it does close to nothing. Like I, I, at one point in my life, I used to micromanage institution spread. Like I used to, you know, do the state edict stuff. Actually, sometimes I still do it, but like, I really don't notice that much of a, a difference between it. And, um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think, <laughs> I, I just think people really overrate this and sadly, I don't have a great mathematical way to show you why it's bad or useless. Okay, here's one that's actually pretty good, the war exhaustion. Um, but you should also be aware that certain religions can get defender of the faith, which generally is enough for war exhaustion. But this is actually quite useful. This is basically useless now. It used to be quite nice, but now it's not that useful because you get uh, leader slots based on force limb as well. Okay, we already talked about this. This is all right. And this one, okay. Advisor costs that. Okay. So what I, I should give some sort of examples on advisor costs, by the way, I mentioned in the previous video that discussing discussions about these th sort of things sort of involve, uh, bragging about yourself or flexing and yeah, I mean, by nature of what I'm discussing, I think I have to talk about my personal anecdotal experiences and compare to other people's anecdotal experiences. And it, it certainly does present itself as showing off. Is that my intent? Uh, well, I hope you believe me. That's not my intent really is to provide data points, but here's an example. Uh, so, so the robot vacuum cleaner was, is that even their design? I think it's like that. There's like a button here. Um, depends on the model. There's like a bin here. <laughs> kind of looks like a person now. See, that's a person, um, in, in like a, in like a pot. Okay. Anyway. So the CERN robotic vacuum cleaner, uh, the other day was saying how advisor costs enabled him to run level three advisors in like, I don't know, like 1510 or something, 1520, basically like early 1500s. Um, well, guess what me by just, you know, playing the game in a particular way, what's me? Uh, I guess online I'm somehow this Greek symbol, right? Uh, well, I was rocking like all five advisors <laughs> in, in 1500 without stacking advisor costs. So like, come on, <laughs> like the whole argument that a uh, stacking advisor costs enable you to get more monarch points, um, is just flawed because of the opportunity cost you lose out on the ability to do things to improve your economy. And it so happens based on my personal experience that you could out somehow outgrow your economy by uh, conquering or playing in a particular manner uh, to sort of more than negate the disadvantage of not having reduction modifiers like this. Okay. Um, but again, I should sort of appeal to the idea of passiveness. Advisor costs, they're not like purely passive because to use, uh, the benefits of advisor costs, you do have to be able to afford whatever final cost it is. But if you go back to like this whole, like, uh, you know, uh, line where this is active and this is passive, 
Well, advisor costs are like probably like here. It's it's very easy to take advantage of advisor costs by doing close to nothing. And I think that shows in revealing certain people's preferences. And that's why I did say in the beginning that there is some like implication that you're bad if you like, you know. I don't like actually mean that you're bad because as I said, um all I think all play styles are like at least theoretically uh, as valuable as others. And just because someone's bad at playing in my style or playing in a way that I think is good doesn't necessarily mean they're bad at the game in some objective sense. But uh, I, I think uh, the sort of um, split does sort of correspond to the fact that new players will certainly prefer that, right? New players will probably be able to take advantage of advisor costs more than some of the things here, like CCR. Okay, what else did I say I'll talk about? Oh yeah, let's talk about espionage. So here's espionage. First of all, I must say that I don't like how espionage is being developed. Okay, so 1.34, uh, the current patch, introduced stuff like Siege Ability, I think. Did they have Siege Ability before? I know that like in like 1.30, they certainly didn't. Uh, they also introduced, I'd like to say they introduced Advisor Cost, but I might be wrong here. They definitely buffed Early Corruption from 0.1 to 0.2. I should probably change colors when I'm writing here. Yeah, um, I think this is new as well. This is probably new too, I don't know. But if you sort of look at the things I've sort of boxed out, these have nothing to do with spying. <laughs> like, these are relevant to spying. This is relevant to spying. Um, this is relevant to spying. This is relevant to spying. It's like Paradox sort of gave up on the idea that espionage ideas somehow make you better at spying. Like they've given up on trying to make spying as an overall mechanic, like something worth doing for the player. So they've said, okay, let's just sprinkle it with modifiers that somehow uh, using like mental gymnastics, I can justify as being related to spying. Like you can say, oh, siege ability, you can get more siege ability because you have better spines to sort of, I don't know, do fort stuff. Uh, I don't know how you justify advisor costs from spying. Maybe you blackmail your advisors and, and pay them less. Uh, corruption, you know, again, you can sort of justify using like some weird like IRL spy argument. But like, but like seriously, like if, if you like, if you're being like onyx, honest about this, like the ones I circled are, sorry, oops, I should use a different color. Like if you're being really honest about this, let's use rainbow. Like, these are what espionage as a concept should be about, right? These modifiers, these modifiers. And it's like they gave up on trying to make that use, make, make, push that direction. So I, I don't like, and that's why I don't like how espionage is being changed. Like, I wish they sort of rework or add stuff to spying as a concept. To, and maybe like add new modifiers to sort of support uh, the changes and, and then sort of make espionage better, not by sprinkling with a bunch of uh, modifiers that people like value, you know? But anyway, so first of all, there seems to be this fallacy that if something has been buffed, it must be good. It must be currently good, right? And in some sense, yeah, if it's buffed, it can only get better from what it previously was. But like, you can certainly go from bad to like less bad. Right? It's not necessarily the case that this like sort of implication has to sort of immediately jump it to God tier status. Okay, so there's certainly this idea that people are sort of overreacting to the buffs. Okay, just because something has been buffed doesn't mean it's necessarily good, you have to really dig in and think about it. Okay, 
and um, I would say another reason why espionage is sort of maybe overvalued is it's this overreaction or overcorrection maybe. I think that's the correct term to use. Because espionage truly used to be really bad. Like, it was just really bad um, in, in the past. And over time, it's been sort of buffed, right? I don't know if there were four buffs. I think I can identify three buffs at least. But, um, and, and so in, in, because of this past relic that espionage used to be really bad, uh, lots of people still have the impression that espionage is like horrible, okay? So this is like horrible. Sorry, this is like, uh, yeah. Well, okay, we're here. So let's offend the people who like, you know, they've already left my video anyway. I don't think this is true actually. Like it knows decent, just not like insanely good. But let's just pretend it knows the worst idea group, which I don't think is true. Um, and on the right, we have admin. Okay, actually, if people who really like Inno hasn't left, they might think this refers to the best and this refers to the worst. <laughs> but um, I would say like the current state of espionage might be like here. But there are lots of people think who think it's here. Um, and they're quite vocal too on the other side. So I think there's some overcorrection over going on where people who like espionage um, sort of pretend that's here. Okay, so try to overcorrect people. And... That's a very like intellectually dishonest thing, but uh, it's not necessarily like, you know, a, it's not clear that whether that's a bad thing or not, it, like, okay. Um, but let's get to the actual modifiers. So first of all, I would say espionage as a core concept in U4 sucks. It's not useful. And the fact that you require a diplomat to, um, make spy networks just makes espionage such a useless thing because in single player u4 it's generally you versus the world assuming you're playing in a manner to you know expand or optimize your country's economy or whatever um and so you genuinely don't have the time to like spy network everyone it just doesn't work because it because spy networking someone requires a diplomat. If it uses some other resource, then I can actually see espionage being like a more fundamental part of the gameplay loop. But currently, because of that diplomat dependence, I would say it is not. Okay. Now we go on to so so basically anything in rainbow is like kind of useless. Not exactly useless, but pretty like useless. <coughs> um. A impact. So A impact is another notion falls under substitutability as well. Okay. So why do people get AE? Aggressive expansion reduction. Well, that's to minimize the actual aggressive expansion they get when they conquer things, right? Why do they do that? Because they don't want to deal with coalitions. Well, there's another way to not deal with coalitions, which is to, for example, truce lock, have a strong country. AIs won't coalition you if you're too strong. Um, and so in, in some sense, people who are not able to do this or play styles that uh, don't enable them to do this, will prioritize aggressive expansion more, lowering aggressive expansion more, because that's one way to uh, lower the impact of coalitions to your gameplay loop. And reductive modifiers are certainly good when stacked. And so in certain cases, yeah, this 20% can take you from like, I don't know, like 60% A reduction total to like 80%. And that's a huge deal. That's like half the AE. So I, I, I do sort of get that 20% A is pretty good. I don't think, but again, I, I should just say that I've demonstrated, for example, other people have too, that you don't need to stack AE 
to conquer like a madman. You just need to sort of be use other avenues to deal with coalitions. Okay. But right. So so all I'm saying here is that um, it's good for certain people and it's not that good for certain people. Uh, siege ability quite nice, but it's only ten percent. Um, I'll maybe talk about siege ability later. Advisor cost I already talked about. Um, and the rest are like, whatever, fluff. Okay, next. My throat hurts already, so let's go a bit quickly. Horde gov ideas. Horde gov ideas. Why, is horde, why are horde gov ideas bad? Well, again, this is playstyle dependent. Hordes don't need cav. First of all, this is a popular misconception. People think that hordes must go cav. And they sort of appeal to either roleplay reasons, like, um, you know, hordes like to be on horses historically. Uh, they also appeal to um, certain bonuses, like, for example, hordes get extra shock damage in flat terrain, and cav tends to have more shock than infantry. Um, many like national ideas of hordes tend to have like cav damage or like cav modifiers. So like, yeah, like it sort of plays into their strengths, but even despite that, you don't need cav. In fact, infantry is better for optimized gameplay. Just let that sink in. Okay. For example, in my, uh, in fact, in like pretty much all my horde runs, like, I'm just listing numbers here. Who knows what these numbers mean? Oh, shoot. I forgot the number here. Um, I never built a single cav. I think. Maybe I have, but rare. I if I have, I've forgotten about it. You can argue that I have built a, my, a cav here because uh, this was when Merck's, Merck companies became a thing. 1.31. Well, 1.30 introduced Merc companies, but and so I guess by nature of hiring certain Mercs, I've hired Cav accidentally. Uh, but no, hordes don't need Cav. I'm sorry. So what this does is this makes Cav like almost as cheap as infantry in, in certain setups. You actually need a bit more than this if you don't have other modifiers. But yeah, this actually does make Cav fairly cheap and certainly. Um, would enable, for example, even m someone like me to take CAV or justify rather, but you're taking an idea group for it. You're taking an idea group just to make CAV viable. Think about it like that. Yeah, this makes CAV viable, but infantry works. It's for hordes. Uh, AE, again, like A's, especially for a horde, like useless. Uh, but again, this depends on your play style, right? Again. I don't know how many times I have to mention it, but I feel like if I don't mention it a hundred times, someone's going to say, oh, but for this play style, I've blah, 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 which is totally true, um, but I just don't want to hear about it. Okay, there's what? Religious unity. Religious unity is quite interesting. Um, it's quite nice, but I should sort of, mm, how should I say it? There, so first of all, there are ways to get religious unity now. Okay, so I guess this isn't substitutability. This is like actual substituting. Like there are ways to get RU flat out, like monuments. In the past, there wasn't. Uh, in the past, the only way you get RU was directly through RU or by stacking tolerance of heathens, which is really hard unless you were like Kazan or Golden Horde, which admittedly are like at least Golden Horde, admittedly, is like an idea group that you should strive for as a Horde anyway. But um, yeah, RU used to be very important back in the days uh, because it affected stab cost and therefore uh, truce breaking. But in like so-called optimized gameplay nowadays, not really. Uh, land attrition, same idea. You have like infinite manpower as a Horde if you play well. Uh, national, so okay, so this is like substitutability. I should probably list that. Unrest, it's one, come on. At least give me two, but it's actually nice, but 
Uh, I would say this is like, eh. It, it's not. It's nothing to take home about. It's just an okay modifier. Nothing game changing. Uh, Caravan power. I'm not even gonna talk about it. Promoted cultures. That's like quality of life, but again, substitutable. Well, this is like a direct notion of substitutability. Oops. Where uh, you can actually get max prom a lot of max promoted cultures by stacking mission trees nowadays. And CCA again, meme. Tribal loyalty, equilibrium, meme. So I think you're, you're sort of getting a pattern here. What I'm doing is going through the idea groups and saying, yeah, these things are OK or nice. Right? I like I accepted that siege, uh, AE siege ability. Those are like nice things to have. But they're not nice enough. You can think of an idea group as an idea group slot as a resource. That's one way to think about it. Well, it's not really a resource. It's sort of like governing capacity. You know, you have a certain amount, uh, namely eight, but but uh, you unlock it over time, right? So instead of saying I am gonna take inno ideas and get these modifiers, you should think of it as I'm going to spend an idea group slot. Well, and like monarch points to fill out the ideas. Uh, to enact inno and then get certain modifiers, okay? And then you can sort of now understand that just because the modifiers have nice things doesn't necessarily mean the idea group is somehow uh, useful in, in this context because um, you have other things that can sort of fit in here. So idea groups have to compete with some other idea groups. Uh, humanist religious. Oh yeah, so here's an interesting bit that I figured I should talk about. Um, somehow in EU4, um, many idea groups, I think, have this sort of uh, presentation where it's present, uh, yeah, presentation where um, it seems like there's a dichotomy or some sort of like um, alternative style. And I think the most uh, prolific of these cases would be humanist and religious. Oops. And at, at a first glance, yeah, like it makes sense that these two are, uh, at least in the, in a very naive interpretation considered somehow counter to one another because humanist seems to uh, help you deal with rebels, um, help, help you deal with provinces that aren't your right religion, like wrong religion. And in some sense, like, um, well, yeah, like freshly conquered, I guess, is another one. While religious gives you stuff to convert your provinces Technically, it also gives you like culture conversion modifiers. So the intuition here is that at a first glance, religious seems to make all your provinces this like homogenous religion and culture. So you deal with rebels that way. Humanist says, well, let's make everything, uh, whatever culture it is, whatever religion it is, um, more happy. And so generally people advocate taking one or the other. People deal with rebels by taking one or the other. That's that's the general advice that's given. And that is, again, false. OK. And this, again, has to appeal to experience, but from my experience, you cannot convert provinces as quickly as you conquer them in optimized gameplay. Just not a thing. I can't see myself doing a one faith in like 1400s. That seems really hard. 
Maybe for rebels you can, but using missionaries, I don't think so. Okay, maybe I can in the 1400s. I have like, yeah, I probably can. But it, it's certainly slower than conquest. And I think that's the important thing to think about. It's the idea that like, if you're taking religious, you're going to get rebels on freshly conquered provinces. Um, and you won't get rebels in like your core provinces anyway, because it has no separatism. So in some sense, like humanist is much better than religious at preventing rebels because because uh, really unrest is about hitting certain thresholds. Like once your unrest is negative, it doesn't matter how negative it is, except that it provides a buffer for when you get extra global unrest, for example, like overextension and stuff. Um, so the key use of religious is actually in the final modifier, the dos volt CV, the, and why? Because you can conquer provinces without paying unjustified demands without. Humanist does not help you conquer anything, at least directly, I guess in, in some indirect sense it does by lowering the number of rebels therefore giving you more manpower and troops. But religious's true beauty is this. It gives you a CB. So in my sort of play style, um, humanist really is different. It serves a very different role than religious. Religious is just paying a bunch of admin points to get the CB, honestly. Like, yeah, like the other modifiers are kind of nice, but Really, the biggest thing is this. For literally one, I'm spending, you know, 400 times 7 minus, you know, idea cost reduction. Uh, admin just for a CB on everyone. Like, like, yeah, I can go through all the modifiers and say, like, oh, this is nice, this is nice. But the key crux is this. And there is no substitutability here that's reasonable. The only substitutability is to stack unjustified demands or uh, spy network more and fabricate claims, uh, but neither are really viable alternatives. Um, influence gives minus 50 unjustified demands. Sadly, that's not enough. Like, I've, uh, I've tried it. It's not enough. So, yeah. Uh, and then... So what was my point here? So I guess my point is just because at a first glance, certain idea groups look sort of dual to one another, another, that doesn't mean that if you take one, you shouldn't take the other. You should be aware of what roles um, a particular idea group is going to serve for your country. And you should sort of, uh, or, or rather, you should rethink the role of certain idea groups. Um, like the naming and like the suggestions by the game developers aren't necessarily gonna apply to your playstyle. Here's another one which makes my point like even more clear. Quality and quantity. They're both pretty bad. Um, but on one hand, the intuitive idea is one makes your troops stronger. And what makes your troops uh, bigger, right? So I, I guess this sort of dichotomy seems to appear in uh, like the real world as well, where um, people sort of meme about how like Russia, for example, has a lot of quantity, uh, but not much quality. But like, these two aren't at all mutually exclusive. These two complement each other. Having more chunky troops. Am I using this correctly? I don't know how. It doesn't attempt at me referencing like Zoomer language. Um, but having more troops 
um, complements very nicely with having stronger troops, actually. Although, I should admit that at a certain point, there are diminishing returns for improving your troop strength. Like, going from 200% discipline to 5,000% discipline, well, sure, like, maybe on, like, in terms of, like, a ratio thing, give you, like, insane KDA differences, or KA differences, sorry, KD differences, but it, it, it might sort of make a battle that you stack wipe with while losing 100 troops, a battle that you stack wipe with 10, 10 troop loss, which is not really relevant in the grand scheme of things. So, huh, that was a lot. I guess that's all. I wish I can condense what I said in like 30 minutes, but I did say a lot. So hopefully if you got here, you weren't like taking notes and paying attention because I would say that's a waste of time and you were sort of listening to this on the background while doing other things that are more relevant for your life. Um, but, well, nah, never mind. I was gonna say like maybe you can use this to argue against very fervorous people, but that's not true. Like they don't listen listen to reasoning or logic. You know, they they just kind of they they're already they've convinced themselves. So it's sort of, in my opinion, like fairly uh, uh, futile to <laughs> try try to do any sort of uh, conversions of people's ideas. No pun intended there. Actually, pun was kind of intended there. 